Hi, everybody. Pastor Paul LaFontaine and Literal Life Church in Petersburg, Michigan, would like to invite you to take the next half hour and enjoy some time in the Word of God. If you're hungry for more of Christ, we believe you can be fed, and we pray that you'll be blessed. Visit our website for more information at literallife.church. May God bless you, my friend, and may the music and message encourage you today. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my Starting at verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Can you say amen? So this power is what raised Jesus from the dead. When he raised him from the dead and set him in his own, in his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Praise the Lord. Today we celebrate the morning that our Lord rose from the grave, and uh, it's celebrated around the world, and we're thankful for that. We're thankful that people in the world acknowledge, uh, a lot of people acknowledge that he rose again. There's some who don't believe it, some that need proof. And, uh, but there's some who are believers that believe he rose. And this is the day that most of the world gives to celebrate the Lord raising from the grave and coming out of the grave. And that, when he came out of the grave, was a final vindication and proof that he was truly everything that the word said about him. That was the vindication. That was the proof that he was truly everything the word said about him. There had to be a, tr a proof to it. Uh, we can say a lot of things, but then people wait for the proof. Jesus said things, but he had the proof and he followed up with vindication. And so when he rose, that was everything. That was the vindication. And that was the proof that he, truly all the word had said about him uh, and what he had proclaimed while he was on the earth uh, in a ministry three and a half years, what he had proclaimed, it came to pass. And he said in three days, if you destroy this body, if you, if you put this in the ground, if you destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up again. And he proved what he said was true. Let me say something to everybody this morning. God has never failed when he speaks something. God has never failed his word. And it always has come to pass and it always will. God has a perfect track record. People will fail you, and you may have a lack of trust in people, but we can trust God because his word has always come to pass. And the resurrection is the proof of that. And what Jesus said and what the word said he would do, we know that it came to pass, and we're celebrating that this morning. We, we want to go into the subject a little bit, what Paul says here in Ephesians. And uh, by the world knowing that it's the resurrection Sunday, we also know some other things, at least most of us. 
We know that Jesus uh, was both humanity and divinity together. How many believe that? Jesus was both humanity and divinity together as one man. And uh, we, we realize that the Bible says that the fullness, the fullness of the Godhead bodily was in him bodily. In other words, all of God was poured into that vessel. And, and so people don't understand. And I'll just say to you, don't try to figure that out. Don't try to figure it out in your own mind anyway. Because when you try to figure out a man that has full divinity and fully a man, don't try to figure it out because you're going to get it all messed up. Hence, Nicaea, 325 AD. They got it messed up. They were trying to figure out how God was in man. And when man gets his intellect, that's how we get messed up with splitting him into three different persons. Let me tell you, don't try to figure that out with your mind. Ask God for a revelation of it. Can I get an amen this morning? It comes by revelation that we would even come close to understanding how man was full divinity and how he's full humanity. And so we know that, but we also know that at the end of Jesus' life, there, uh, there was a, a very much of the human side displayed. As a matter of fact, as he come to the last days of his life and the last hours of his life, if you know your Bible, you realize Jesus, when he come to the very end, there was very much human in it. Uh, it, it when, when he come to the tragic court case, when he was accused in court, he was an innocent man and he was falsely accused. When he come to the brutal treatment of his body, when he come to the crucifixion, and in a few moments, I might elaborate on that a little bit, knowing that it was Good Friday this past Friday, and we, we look at that, we want to understand those things. But his life at the end came to a, a turn that even the disciples didn't understand with the brutality and the crucifixion and the scourging and the mocking and the making fun of. And he, he lived the, the, the last days of his life, and you can't find God in any of it. Now, early in his life, when he started his ministry, you could find God. The supernatural God was working through his words. In other words, he'd speak, and the blind eyes would be open. He would touch people, and they'd be completely healed. Numerous miracles took place in the supernatural. God was speaking to him. God brought him up to the Mount Transfiguration and said, this is my son in whom I'm pleased to dwell. So God was there. But at the end of his life, there's not many traces of God because God actually, he was there, but he withdrew himself because this man had to go to Calvary as our lamb and he had to go to Calvary as a man because God couldn't be killed. God could not see, be displayed in our eyes anyway in this defeat, in this scourging. And, and we know the story is that the disciples are wondering and, and they're saying even in the, I think the garden is saying, can't you call for help? And all the soldiers, everybody's taking, can't you call for help? And Jesus said, don't you think that I could call for thousands of legions of angels and they would come and change us? And he said, but that the scripture might fulfill. So th there was an obedience to what the Bible said. Can you say amen? had to be fulfilled, and in that moment, God, as it, in our terms, withdrew himself. And so we, we know that it was God in man, but yet we see this, this withdrawal because he had to go to Calvary as our lamb, and uh, in the last hours, in the very last hours, he even with went without any intervention of God. At the cross, there wasn't any intervention of God. We're saying, God, God, don't let this happen. But you see, the scripture had to be fulfilled and we had to be saved. We needed a sacrifice. You couldn't do it on your, you weren't worthy enough. No man was worthy enough. Somebody had to do it for us. And so that's the reason there was no intervention of God in this act is because, and in fact, in fact, he was so much left alone that he cried himself at the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You remember he said that. So this is evidence that he's feeling it, he knows, and he's crying out, why have you forsaken? That's the man crying out because he had to live in that moment that he felt forsaken, even by God. I'd ask for a raise of hands this morning. How many has felt that way yourself? He had to live where he's saying, God, why have you forsaken me? God, wh where are you? God, why? And, and in worldly terms, the last of Jesus' life 
felt like a defeat over and over again. There was no God in it. It felt defeated. It was defeat in man's eyes. But see, see this morning, let the record show that the final end was not defeat. And that's why we talk about the resurrection because as much defeat was there, as much as God hath withdrawn himself, I like the song that the choir sang, Jehovah, Jehovah has the final say. Can I get an amen this morning? And I'm glad to say that the final end was not a defeat, but the final end was a victory. The final end was not all of this uh, being forsaken by God. But you see, the, 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 there was not a defeat, but when the, when the body was dead and in the grave, and that was it, and in a dark, uh, a cold uh, grave with the stone road in front of it, the power of God moved on that body and resurrected that body. Can you say praise the Lord? Jehovah had the final say. I just want to say to you, when God's involved, he'll have the final say of every, every situation, of every condition. Come on, I should have get a bigger amen than that. I know when you're dark and under a tunnel of something and under just under something, it's hard for you to say amen to that, but you should say amen because God has a perfect track record. And when he's involved, he gets the final say. And I can tell you, he's going to cause us to end in victory. And if he did it at the cross and he did it here in Jesus' life, then we find that there was a power, and this is what he says in Ephesians, there was a power that come upon and set Jesus. It was so powerful that he come on his body and raised him from the dead far above principality and power. So there was the power that raised him, and, and he did not just raise out of the grave and, and then walk back into the same conditions again. Did you realize when God raised him, when the power of God raised him up, he, he did not just come back to earth again. Now we know that he walked a few days on earth, but this power did not keep him. This power, he actually went to hell. He, 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 he seen the soul, preached to the souls in prison, but then the power was still on him. He raised, he raised past the grave. He raised past the earth. He didn't come back into the same conditions again. Can you say amen? Then the Bible says he raised far above. And that's my message to you this morning. When God raised him, he raised far above the conditions again. Far above the earth. Can you say amen? Far above defeat. Somebody say praise the Lord. How far did he raise him? Above principalities, above powers. He broke through every demonic dimension. Can you say amen? This power was powerful enough to break through anything. How far did he raise them? Above principality, above power, above might, dominion, every name that is named. The most famous name we've ever had in the world, the Caesars. Even famous names today, God raised his name above every name. Not only in this world, but also in the world to come. And hath put all things under his feet. I'm telling you, this power raised him far above everything. Now, he didn't just raise out of the grave. He didn't walk back into the same conditions, which reminds me of some people that come to church and hear the power of God and don't respond and walk back into their same conditions again. Might be a lesson for us. How many know the Bible says, as Jesus talked about, he says, a man, he said, he, the house can be cleaned. And when the house is sanctified, because see, sanctification isn't enough. I could use a little bit more help this morning. Sanctification isn't enough. Got a lot of people that come under the presence of God, get sanctified. They feel good. They feel better. Their spirits have been released from them. But that's not the final step. Can you say amen? He walks through dry places. And if he don't get that house filled, seven other demons will come and fill that. I'm speaking about what Jesus said. That's how it works. And so I'll tell you, Jesus was not just raised back to earthly conditions. If he'd have showed up the same way, they would have continued the persecution. They would have continued the things and, and all that he was doing, being persecuted of. But I can tell you, God had to raise him above the persecution, above the defeat, above earthly conditions. Far above. How many this morning got things that you've been through and you'd like to be lifted far above those things? He didn't just raise out of the grave. He didn't walk back into the same conditions. The power of resurrection moved in 
actually in a place far above all things, to a position at the right hand of authority of God in a place called heavenly places. This is where the power of God that took the dead body of Jesus and raised him far above defeat and raised him past principalities far above and placed him in a place called heavenly places. And we've been taught by the word of God that that is not a feeling. It's not a sensation. I love the presence of God. I I felt it. I know that it's real. But when he said heavenly places, it's not a feeling. It's not that it gives us tingles. Can you say amen? Heavenly places is the believer's position in Jesus Christ. Somebody say praise the Lord. He lifted Jesus to heavenly places. And I don't know if anybody noticed Uh, and scanned while I was reading about Jesus coming to heaven places. You probably didn't read it, but I'm going to bring it up if you got your Bibles. And if you don't, they're going to have to bring it up back there. I want you to go to Ephesians 1, back a few verses to verse 3, where it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. In Christ. Did anybody notice that the same place Jesus was raised to is the same place Paul's teaching that every believer who has the Holy Ghost has been raised into heavenly places? We got the same position. And guess what? Most Christians don't know it. Most Christians live below their privileges. Now, I want to emphasize that because below your privileges is not where you're supposed to be living. Young people, everybody, below your privileges is not where you're supposed to be living. If we only see our conditions of our broken families, our corrupt world, it's more more than clear to us our conditions. We can see all of that. We can see the, the state that we're in. If that's all we're looking at, then we're doomed. We need to see what Calvary has done for us and what the resurrection has done for us. And that's what he's going to say here. We need to see... What Calvary needs our eyes enlightened, that we know what Calvary has done for us and we know what the resurrection has done for us. That's what I'm preaching to you this morning. That do you know what Calvary has done for you? Do you or or is it just a symbolism? Do you know what Calvary has done for you and your condition? And do you know what the power of the resurrection can do for you in your condition? Who hath believed our report? Who, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's talking about Christ here when he comes. Prophecy. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now notice, this is the mighty conqueror? No, before he was the mighty conqueror, He went through this. What for? For you. And what was he going through? What was he feeling those last few days? He was despised. He was rejected. Anybody ever been rejected before? He was despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs. How is this tied together? He bore the things that we would bear. He felt everything that we would feel. He had to feel it. He had to feel what it meant to be lonely. He had to feel friends rejecting him, even his own disciples. He had to feel being lonely without anybody in the world but just himself. He had to feel that. Because why? You would feel that. Frankly, friends, you would never be able to tell God he doesn't understand what I'm going through. And there might be some people in here that have said that to God. God just, this is new. He doesn't understand why I'm going through. I'm here to correct you about that because if this is our perfect lamb, he experienced what life would be for us. And he bore it. Can you say amen? 
He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him smitten, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. I'm adding in verse six, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So let me tell you something. That scripture tells you you're not in a different category in the sense of your human flesh. All we, all of us, that covers, all kind of covers everybody. I don't care how much pride you have, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. All of us in our own self are weak. Can you say, man? We've made mistakes. We've made blunders. Even if you've hid them very well, you're like a sheep that has gone astray, and you will always go astray unless the shepherd gets a hold of your life. And all the sheep that have gone astray, the answer is one thing, and that's this lamb that's going to Calvary, that whatever way we have strayed, he's given us a sacrifice that we can come back to and say, God, you did it for me. He has a struggle in the garden. And you know what the struggle was over? God's will or his own will. It was pretty intense because he was sweating and he, his, his, his face had become so intense from the pressure and that battle of his own will that it was like great sweat drops of of blood and science says it got so intense that it turns into some blood sweat turns into blood that's the first time he shed his blood and guess what it was related to a struggle over his own will and God's will has anybody ever had the same struggle Amen. is it tense yes in the court under Pilate he's being falsely accused he's being ridiculed he's being made fun of he's being mocked there's a robe put on him to mock him as being king a purple robe and then the crown of thorns the next place he sheds blood a crown of thorns is crushed where where crushed in his head shed blood came from his head anyone ever had any battles in your mind Anyone having them today? You don't have to raise your hand. But I'd say if you live in this world, you have the battle of the mind. This age is mental. This age is going insane. People can't think straight. It's everything that a believer could do. Can he can keep his heart in the word of God to keep his own sound thinking. And I'm here to tell you, the atonement and the shed blood of Jesus Christ addressed every condition of this modern age. He paid the price for you. He shed blood in that area. The, the, this, the mental conditions, the insanity, the addictions of the mind, the pornography, and he shed blood there in his head. Nobody, those soldiers didn't know what they were doing when they crushed it in and blood came out of his head. Now we know what he was doing. Now we know what was taking place. Now we know why he had to shed blood from there. Maybe you can remember that this week when the devil's got your, in a tailspin in your mind. Come on, people. Maybe you can remember what this preacher has said to you. That God did something for you. God shed blood for that. He shed blood at the whipping post, 39 stripes. That's another place he shed blood, and that's when uh, anyone ever being wounded deeply like that, and it was in his back, the, the pieces of metal and different things put at the end of the whip so that it's not just a whipping in a normal sense, but that it would cut the flesh and open up his flesh. And all that is about opening up a wound and all these wounds where the flesh was just hanging down his back. And we know, we know if that person survived, it'll take a long time, but the body would heal itself. Most of the time they died, but they didn't want them to die. They wanted them to suffer. So there was a long healing process to stripes going in his back. But it was, a, it was, it was, it was looking ahead because... Isaiah says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. And by his stripes, we receive healing. Somebody raise your hand if you're sick this morning. By his stripes, I'm healed. He already paid the price for my healing. 
And no, that would take days, months to heal that back. You've seen it in movies sometimes when it took days and uh, months and sometimes years to get a full healing to that back. And sometimes healing is a process, but I can tell you, it's not just the body naturally healing itself. God provided in his atonement that for any sickness, any cancer, any disease, we're not afraid of any of it because he paid the price for any disease to be healed. Somebody say amen this morning. That's my, what, what my Lord means to me this morning. He means so much more to me. And then the shed blood on the cross pierced his side, nails in his hands and in his feet. Blood, of course, came forth from there, but then they pierced his side and blood and water and spirit came out. And that's an important thing because we realize when, when, when his spirit came out, it, 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 <laughs> praise the Lord, the blood cell had to be broken and something had to come out of him. Why? Because we needed that same spirit to be able to live. How many needed that Holy Ghost that come out of him? The blood cell had to be broken so it would come out of him and come back on the day of Pentecost and fill the believers. He shed blood so you could have the Holy Ghost. This was the most cruel death that had ever taken place in history. This was cruelty. He was mocked. He was spit in the face. He was innocent, but he was falsely accused. He was made fun of. Two reasons why they, there was such cruelty in this death. He had to feel what extreme abuse. He had to be abused because there would be people in this generation especially that were abused, sexually abused, mentally abused, emotionally abused, physically abused. He had to be abused. He had to be scourged. He had to be mocked. He had to be made fun of. Can you say amen? And it was extreme cruelty because he had to feel extreme abuse and cruelty and what it felt like so that you could never go to him to say, God, you don't understand. He understands because he felt, he felt, he felt that cruelty. It was secondly an extremely cruel death because sin is relentless. Sin is the most cruelty that can come to a human being. I got a lot of people nodding their heads and say, yes, Brother Paul, what my life has been through, anybody listening? Maybe you've had a pretty cushioned life, but there's some people sitting here that's been saved by grace. But sin, they can tell you sin was cruel to their lives, destroyed their spirit. Drugs destroyed how they think properly. Sin never, sin is only, uh, sin is only uh, 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 some joy for a temporal time, but every time it never ends up right. It's cruel to your life. Our sacrificial lamb, went through all of this for us. He covered all the cruelty of a human experience. His blood covered it all to redeem you. My brother and sister, his blood covered it all so that he could redeem you. Thank you for watching our message today. If you would like more information, please contact us by visiting our website, literallife.church. And if you would like to come and visit us in person, consider this your personal invitation. We're just 15 minutes north of Toledo at 11,100 Summerfield Road in Petersburg, Michigan. God bless you, my friend, and have a blessed day.